marketing. And then there's also the sort of humility to understand actually in some of these domains, this will work, but in a, if I switch domain or something big happens, I need to really revisit my assumptions. Interesting. Well, for those of you just joining us live here, we prioritized a few minutes before this podcast to talk about prioritizing. And that is what we're going to talk about for the next 45 minutes or so. We've got some, we've got some great ideas here that have been brewing the last few minutes. And at the end of the day, uh, in the next 45 minutes, you're going to be hearing insight on prioritization when it comes to product scaling, to dealing with not just the startup challenges, but more importantly, the scale up challenges when the problems get bigger and it's time to reorganize better. Now, my name is Ryan Fallen. I'm a keynote speaker, uh, also an author of a book coming out called Ditch the Act, which Max just read, which is kind of exciting to see it start to come to life. And I've had to prioritize that on top of everything else that's happening. But the priority right now is to let you understand that Max is going to take the mic and we're going to talk here with Sebastian and we're going to take a deep dive. You can find these podcasts at scaleupvalley.com. There are a ton of them and we're here every week. So, Mr. Max, I'm going to pass the mic to you and then let's rock and roll. And for those of you out there listening, uh, I am going to be listening as well. And this this, uh, this big old post-it note is going to be filled with my mental mind map. All right. And... There you go, Max. You're on. Thanks, John. Yeah, and you know, I, I did love the book. I'll say that. I'll say that again live. I think you know, it's really phenomenal. One of you, know, one of the most interesting and in insightful books ever for a while. So looking forward Thank to that. Thank you. Coming out in October. Um, so prioritization. You know, I lead product at Manis. We have ten teams, and one of the things that I try and do is help the teams understand what to work on. And one of the problems I have is is what should they work on? How should how should I help them do that? And how do we make sure we do that as a company? So I'm you know, very very pleased to be joined by uh, by Sebastian from Salary Finance um, to explore this whole concept. So um, Sebastian, can you just introduce yourself? I don't, you know, everybody would love to know yeah. more. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm Sebastian. I'm head of product at Salary Finance, which is uh, which is now one of the fastest growing fintechs uh, in the UK. Um, we've got a pretty hot fintech sector uh, out here at the moment, so uh, so things are going pretty well. Business is, uh, has, has grown massively over the last year, so we now have, uh, I think it's, it's eight people in my product team with, uh, with two UX people as well, which is a massive imbalance in terms of product versus UX, but we're, we're trying to fix that. Um, and yeah, the, the dev team is, is now pretty considerable, so prioritization has gone from being something that we could do relatively easily to something that we could do with a hell of a lot more effort. So it's uh, mm. it's an interesting topic and uh, and one one that is kind of nerve wracking because actually I'm not sure how well as a business we do it or how well anyone really does it. Mm. And I think that's a really interesting question because it's quite difficult to to understand that. I think a lot of a lot of the stuff we build is is a guess on what could happen in the future. You know, I don't think you know, I've definitely not found a sort of you know, the ability to, to look into the future and see what will work and what won't work. So a lot of it's about educated guessing and trying to sort of, you know, to understand that. You know, your point about the London, the London fintech scene at the moment, you're right, it's really hot. I think, you know, we're struggling to hire, um, but it's super exciting if you see it's, you know, so the, the likes of yourself and how quickly you've grown, which is just phenomenal, just both in terms of the size of the teams, but the size of your customer base has been massive. So I'd love to sort of see how, wh where are you, where are you now in your prioritization journey? Sort of how do you do it as a sort of company level? Let's start up there and then, and then let's go down. Okay, so I mean, at a company level, um, I think the business is going through a, a huge transition. So when you're a startup, you have often like the CEO just can make decisions because he's he's in control of pretty much all the information. He knows almost everything that's going on. He's speaking to all the most important clients. Um, in fact, in many cases, he might be speaking to all the clients. Um, he's physically seeing the, the actual end users who are coming through. He kind of understands everything that's going on. So really, when it comes down to it, the CEO can make most of the decisions and make them pretty well. Um, so that that's kind of where the journey starts. And then over time, you scale up, you get more specialists and you get people who are doing that. And you know, then quite frankly, the CEO is spending 10 minutes a day thinking about your area of the role. So mm -hmm. from, from that part, he's, he's now very much going through that learning journey of how do I actually engage with a leadership team and enable them to, to actually make most of the prioritization decisions. So I think as a business, the way that's fundamentally shifted is we've got much clearer on what our goals are as a business. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't have a clear target of, well, we're trying to achieve this, and these are the, we use OKRs actually as a, as a business mm -hmm. resource. Um, these are the actual OKRs that we're aiming at, and this is 
what it then means for your area, it becomes really hard to make connected and joined up decisions as soon as you have that. And as soon as you have enough information about what the business is doing, in many ways, the CEO then has to almost get out of the way of the rest of the business to allow them to make most of the other decisions. Because if he gets too involved in everything else, he's only going to mess it up. Um, not because he's not brilliant, mm. but because he just doesn't have the information. He doesn't have the knowledge that, that other people do. So it's it's a really it's a really interesting time for the business because it's going through that process. So we haven't we haven't made it all the way there, but we're definitely in that process of of doing that. So from a business point of view, that's that's what's really going on. And they're they're trying to get a lot more scientific over how they do these things. Uh, brilliant. I think there's two things I'd love to jump into on there, which was one, which was about context, which I thought was which I thought was super interesting. So let's jump into let's jump into that first. I think you know when you're small, you know, lots of people can see everything that's going on. So you're right, that sort of that sort of really cuts in. But then, you know, the, the law of mathematics, you know, the CEO can't spend time as much time with 100 people as he could with 10, so that he then gets subtracted. Um, I, you know, I'd be, I've really found that context works with both ways. There is always something that CEO context yeah. the CEO has, whether that's from investors, whether that's from you know his passion for starting the business in the first place. Um, but then the bigger the organization, the further they move away CEOs or the leadership team, the further they move away from the customer. And then the, but the teams actually have a lot more interface with the customer, but then they miss the cut. So how do you sort of try and bridge that context gap? Um, so again, it's very much a work in progress. Um, so I think one of the things we try and do is we do try to bring the, that insight. So obviously we have UX people and we have product managers who are going out and they're speaking to customers on as regular a basis as they can. I'd love to say they were doing it, you know, every week on a rigorous basis, but the reality is mm. life gets busy and they don't necessarily always manage to do it, but they're out there, they're speaking to the customers and then they have to work out how can they package that information up in a way that is then consumable back to the leadership team members who simply don't have the time to go through that, that long, deep learning that you're going to go through. So we then create lots of different resources. So we'll, you know, we use Confluence as our, our way of documenting everything that we're doing. So uh, we do a Confluence page and often we would work really closely together to, to hone a Confluence page until the message on there is really clear because those sorts of documents, the CEO probably won't read 100% of it. So um, when this business we use something called, um, there's a book called Pyramid Principles, mm -hmm. which talks about how you should lay out documents. Um, and really, everything that you want to say should be contained inside the first few sentences. So then if a CEO wants to jump in and have a look at that, that you share him, you should hook him in enough that he knows everything that's important, but he wants to find out more. So then you, you work really well to give him that customer insight. Um, we then do, you know, we do business plans. Um, we ruthlessly stole from Amazon and we often do press releases for our, our products before we're gonna, gonna start anything. And we, we help to try and give them all the tools they need but we still have to understand that in the end, the decisions have to still rest with the leadership team because they're the ones who ultimately are responsible as the main leaders of the business for delivering it. So it's our job to give them the right amount of information to enable them to make the, make those right, mm -hmm. at least at the highest level, the prioritization decision. Now, 90% mm -hmm. of the prioritization decisions then happen at a level below that because you then have the, the overall guidance, but you still mm -hmm. need to give them all the tools so that they can go, Okay, yeah, that's that's what that's what what it is, and then they've got enough insight to be able to tell you if you're you're wrong or if they they don't believe you. So you have to be you have to be on it, and they're still gonna they'll still have data points that you don't have. So they'll still know things about the business, about the investors, about everything else that's that's in there, and potentially some of the markets which they're looking at different things. So they can still make decisions which you may not have made, um, and it's really important that that you have that circle going round. Otherwise, if we make decisions without their input, they won't go anywhere. And uh, if they make decisions without our input, again, probably they won't go anywhere because we won't buy into them. We won't do them. So we're all human beings here and no one can dictate to us what we're going to do. So even if a leadership team says, hey, go do this thing, we think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, trying to force a group of people who don't know why they're doing something or what it's for and haven't been involved in the decision making process is really hard work. I think I think one of the lines that I picked up is we're all human. You know that that's so true. Like with all of the, you know, working in consultancy and everything else, everybody's got a, you know nice flow diagrams of how this should all work. Um, and, and, and you know, and real life is, is is much much messier. 
Um, and you know, it's, it's really interesting because it's, it, it sort of sounds like, but correct me if I'm wrong, is teams go away and do the work. There's some sort of packaging of that, which is interesting because that's you know that's really you know, that's actually quite sophisticated. You know, either you use the Amazon six pager, we we use we use a kickoff, which is sort of more in person. Um, with everybody, you know, I, I think a number of companies have got to the point where they do that. But it sounds like yeah. the team have like, this is this is it, and then and then and then the leadership team approve it, or or is it a sign off? Or I mean, let let me be really blunt. We are not at the place where we are, are consistently always following the process, right? Mm-hmm. So there are still there are still projects that that don't necessarily follow the the ideal path that we we would like them to do and then we pick up the the pieces of that and try and do what we can uh in the ideal process yes we would create the documents we would attend the leadership meeting and it's it's all about the discussion after that so we give people the opportunity to do it um one thing i'm keen to do which we haven't done yet is to try and find someone in the business who completely disagrees with your idea and allow them to come and essentially reverse pitch the the ideas and say we shouldn't be doing this for all of these reasons, um, because often I find that particularly what you do as a human being, again, is you try and pitch the ideas that you think are going to be successful. Even mm-hmm. if you go, oh, I want to try and pick something that's not that I think is a bit controversial. Mm-hmm. You end up still wanting to go and pick the things that you you sense the rest of the leadership team are likely to, to go with because that's that's you as a person. Mm-hmm. So whatever you're doing, trying to find someone who disagrees, it's not something I'm doing right now, but it's something that's like in our list of things that we're trying to get to, because I think it's it's really important that we don't end up getting into a group thing. Um, one of the things I do inside the meetings is we allow each person and each member of the leadership team and often product managers as well, depending on the particular setting, to go one by one and have their say on the thing. And we try and make the CEO talk last um, because what you find is mm. if the CEO or the, the season decision, senior decision maker, whoever it is in your business speaks first, everyone else just says pretty much a carbon copy of that. Now, we haven't strong enough personalities that they will disagree. But the more the earlier the CEO speaks, the more likely it is that everyone will agree with him. Um, and if you can allow everyone to have some form of independent thinking and independent voice, you're going to get much more information out into the open that then allows us to make a better decision. That's really interesting because you know, definitely at Moniz, definitely that nobody agrees or no, you know, people are disagreeing with the CEO or anybody is, is we've built quite a strong culture around that. Obviously, yeah. there's there's a difference between, you know, we have this saying in English, which is play the ball, not the player, you know, playing the idea on its merits is is absolutely fine. But tackling the player or being personal is just not acceptable. But no, uh, definitely. And I, I'd like to pick up on that because I, I think, you know, within my own team, I, I feel like I've got to the point where everyone is quite happy to contradict me. However, I still know that if I say something, there's way more hesitation from everyone to disagree because it's mm. we're still hierarchical animals. So we're still mm. we're still that that monkey that's come from the tree that understands, OK, well, this is how hierarchy works and I should try and play nice. So even when you believe that you've got to the point where everyone disagrees openly, that you have for me you have to be really really consciously aware all the time that Mm. that that isn't quite right so anything you can put into the process that enables everyone to speak their mind before the highest paid person has come in and says what they think then then that that's really valuable because it allows everyone through the process to have their say and for the the person who in the end is going to make the hardest decisions to actually have all the information they need to do that Mm. No, I think I think that's really interesting. I think hierarchy hierarchy is by itself neutral. I think how how you use yeah. hierarchy, you could use it exactly people, but also but also different cultures see hierarchy in much you know in in very different ways. So you know, there's a number of lenses that you sort of have to be careful of. Um, but I think you know being being aware of that and being aware of the risks that you face by either being over overly hierarchical or dominant versus sort of. And you know, one of the one of the most important things I read was you know, the end of holacracy. There's been a number of experiments now with holacracy where there's no hierarchy and they all seem to have yeah. failed for one reason or another. But then also, uh, which I just think is is, is very interesting. Um, but also, you know, if you look at Google's Project Oxygen or Project Aristotle, you know, leaders making being decisive is always seen as very positive by followers. But also is very strongly correlated with success. So, and decision making yeah. is about prioritization, which I think is is is, is fascinating and very, and very very interesting. How do you how do you try and encourage that? How do you encourage the 
the openness, the, you know, so, you know, Google calls, calls it psychological safety, but, but the idea that people can speak up constructively about questions about prioritization. Um, it's, it's always a challenge because people get so busy with their day-to-day -day work that they forget that they need to, to come in and actually challenge the, the decisions that are made. Um, I, th I think we do, well, wh one thing we have is I, I've got a, a product manifesto, which has like a, a whole list of, I think it's about 21 behaviors that we, we do with, with three of the, the things being uh, given more importance. And one of, those, one of those main things is we give feedback to each other often. Um, and that's, that's within our team, but it's also within the wider, uh, within the wider business, because we're trying to create that, that attitude of, always telling people what you think, what's going on and doing it in a way that, again, it treats the behavior, it doesn't treat the individual because if you ever go, well, this is, you're, this is stupid, then you will, you will lose the argument. Whereas if you can go, ah, I, I think the way this idea is presented is X, Y, Z. And if you think, ah, the way you behaved in this situation, it caused this impact. You, again, you, you're always denutralizing. So that's, that's one way to create the safe space is to, to kind of train people, to teach people and to, to open things up because people come from who knows what environments and you don't know what their previous role was really mm -hmm. like. So often they bring in the scars of things that make them feel mm -hmm. worried. And you may have created the nicest, warmest atmosphere, but it takes them forever to get to mm -hmm. the point where they'll actually open up because they've just got the scars. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, obviously, you know, we're all nice to each other and we do all that kind of stuff, but I do continue in, in every meeting where you can to, to do lots of those things where you, you know, you'll use post-it notes, you'll allow people to, to share their information privately before they then have to, to share it publicly because um, the, the simple fact is the, the quieter members of the team, and there's always quieter members of the team, um, and they are often the most valuable ones, mm -hmm. they have just as many thoughts. It just takes them often a little bit longer to, to, to articulate them and a little bit more worry about articulating them. So if you kind of have a, a process whereby everyone has to write down what they're thinking and then they have to, in an individual way, explain what they're thinking, then you allow those conversations to happen so that all the weakest members of, not, sorry, that's the wrong word, not the weakest members, but all the members of the team who are more introverted and who are, are likely to have the best idea but say nothing, you allow them to have their say in a structured way. Um, and it can be really jarring the first few times you do that sort of thing because everyone in the room is used to having quite open sessions where the loudest person mm. talks. And I always find that in a team of, say, 10 or 15 people, it's always the same three or four people who say the most, the most stuff. So by changing it and making the meeting more structured and forcing people to have that, that chat, it creates a safe space where they, they believe that their opinion is actually valued because it is valued and because they're given a, a way to do it where actually hopefully the loudest people speak last and they don't even get the opportunity to influence anyone. And I think, you know, and, and, and you know, I must admit, I'm myself one of the people who's, who's speaking the, the most and it's, it's something I definitely yeah. have to work on and improve. Um, but, but we all. yeah, exactly. But, but, but in some contexts it's quite helpful in other contexts it's, it, it's not yeah. that helpful. So I, I definitely think there's an element of, an, an element of, of context there. But what I, what I have found, and this sort of directly ties in with sort of with Ryan's book is, you know, being honest and open about your mistakes and talking about them publicly, um, you know, not, not in terms of self-flagellation or, or talking about it just because it's now the sexy thing to do, but sort yeah. of being open and honest and talking through what's happened, it sort of engenders this ability for people to, to sort of reciprocate. Um, and I, I, felt, yeah, I felt that being very, very powerful. Um, I completely agree. Um, I've, I've, it, it's really hard to talk about mistakes really honestly and really openly at the time that they're, they're actually happening. So I think this is one of those, those things that it's such a, it's such a cliche now because everyone says, well, you should be honest about your mistakes. What people like to be honest about is the mistake that happened six months ago that had a fantastic result in the end. Right. Yeah. Because they, they want to, they want to say that, like they don't want to talk about the, the project. Like, it just happened Friday where where something we were aiming to prioritize like, or one of the product managers was trying to prioritize it didn't work because they'd spent four weeks doing some work and they hadn't got the right level of buy-in ahead of time now does anyone really want to talk about that mistake right now no because mm. it's still painful that is the time to talk about it because that's the time when you can process it you can go through it and i think i think that's the that's the thing when it does come to mistakes is it is it's really hard because 
and I, I suffer from this really badly. I've got a very big ego, as probably most people who get to senior positions do. And really opening up and saying, mm, yeah, I, I basically messed that up and we need mm. to talk about how we're going to fix it. And probably you're going to have to fix my mistake. Um, that's not a fun or easy thing to say as a leader, but I've had to do that and I will have to do that many, many times again. So yeah, that, that does really help to create a safe space. One, one thing just to chirp in here, um, what I found in trying to explain these dynamics uh, seems to work well when I talk about going first or second. And it, I'm curious your thoughts. The concept is that the normal pleasantry is you walk into the meeting, the office, hey, how's the project going? Good, good. It's good. Yeah, good, good. Everybody's like this whole, like, mer, mer, they just repeat whatever the first one says, like the CEO. But everyone wants to go second. So the first person that's like, well, actually, uh, you know, I'm, I'm running into a little bit of struggles here. That's them going first. And then somebody's like, Somebody just went first. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I was having a little bit of trouble over here. And then it's that same like cascading effect. So sometimes it just starts with whoever it is, which happens to be that leader to be like, I'm going to go first real quick. And I'm going to say, here's what's not going right. Mm. It gives almost permission for others to do it when secretly they're like, don't want to be first. I, I don't know that concept of being first or second um, seems to resonate in this kind of context. Uh, for me personally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like if you're the leader of the team you and you want to engender a behavior the only way that people will have that behavior it doesn't matter how many times you tell them they will they will look at what you do and mm -hmm. if you say be honest about your mistakes and let's celebrate them and let's do all of that kind of stuff and then when something goes wrong you hide and you say nothing and you don't tell people about it and you try and cover it up then what do you think they're going to do next time mm -hmm. so um absolutely like as a it, it's it's absolutely fundamental. I mean, this is this is talking more about leadership necessarily than just about mm -hmm. product. But yeah, as a as a leader, if you're in that position, you must always must always go first. You must model the behavior that you want and not tell people the behavior you want. Otherwise, what do you think you're going to get? And do you think that the that the the non leader, the employee, can they go first to spark leadership to sort of admit as well? Do you think that it can work the other way? And that's that's scary for an employee. You know, when bringing it back to the prioritization. If you sort of really want to raise your hand because in what your sphere is, your information, you know that needs to be addressed uh, and your leadership isn't necessarily being the first one, what do you do to encourage the employees to be the first to sort of reverse um, that leadership trend if it's specifically towards something that is something that needs to be prioritized for that employee? Okay. I mean, we're talking in quite a general, general way. I think, I think it's difficult. So, um, Absolutely anybody should and could raise their hand. It all depends on the culture of the business that you're in, right? So there there will be times and there will be places where the leaders are going to be open to that. Um, and like particularly if they, their mantra is we want to do these things, we want to change this way of working, blah, 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 then you can use those as tools to say, well, look, this is what we state. And based on that, I think X, Y, Z if the company doesn't have that culture and it doesn't have that way of working, you're going to have to put a lot of effort in to change something because you're not just fighting the potentially wrong decision. You might be fighting a culture that doesn't really accept that. So in salary finance, hundred percent people do often raise up from the lowest, lowest point of view. Yeah. I might be the most junior person on this project, but I can see that this is going wrong and I feel comfortable to say this isn't the right decision for these reasons. Um, and people listen because that's the culture. I think if you don't have that culture, I don't think it's going to be easy for the most junior person to do that. I don't think that that gives them an excuse to not try and to not find a way, but you would have to, you'd have to take your time to think through how you were going to do it, what you were going to do, who are the influential people you're going to need on your side to make that impact because you know, companies are tricky and people are tricky. And um, it's not because they're deliberately there. I, I very much use the Brene Brown assumed positive intent, which is, everyone is doing the best that they possibly can, but we all have our blind spots. We all have the things that we're not looking at. And if you're gonna go and attack a blind spot, you're gonna to have to do it really carefully and really thoughtfully. So yes, yes, the lowest, lowest member of the team who's the most junior can definitely have an impact and they should be encouraged to do that. And if you've got the current building culture right, it should almost be they are the one that you listen to the most. But if the company culture isn't there, yes, get involved. But just just tread carefully. Use your brain. Think think it through. Find a way to to make that impact because you can. It just takes time. 
What I hear is that the leaders need to prioritize the right kind of culture yes. environment for the right. Okay, Max, back to you. Sorry, I was excited to jump no, no, in. I think, you know, I, I think we did something, you know, you know, whenever I got into the lean movement in Toyota, the fact that, you know, anybody on an entire production line can hold their hand up and stop the production line. Mm. So, so we took that, we, you, know, we, they, you know, it doesn't necessarily stop, stop deployment of code, but, but anybody, everybody, we've put it on people's job descriptions and, you know, everybody must speak up. It's not, it's not, it's not required. Yeah. It's not nice to have. Everybody must speak up. You know, they're not always going to be listened to. They will be listened to. You know, they'll definitely be listened to. We might not you know, make a decision or change something, but, but everybody yeah. will listen to it. And it's about when somebody does that, especially for the first time, especially for juniors, it's about asking them lots of questions. Because what I found is you know, executives or people who've been consultants are really good at getting their points across. They're structured. They've thought it through. Yeah. They thought about their evidence. They used the Barbara Minto's pyramid principle. But, but somebody straight out of university or has just spent their time engineering is uh, you will we'll package that information in a different way. So you have to be really forgiving. You have to really understand. You have to say, you have to ask a lot of questions about, you know, in, and instead of, right, I, I don't understand what this person is saying because it's not in the way that you're used to consuming it. You have to just ask a question of a question uh, in different ways, play it back to them, help them structure it. And then, yeah, and then you'll suddenly go, actually, there's a real point here, or, or actually, I've not provided some piece of context here that they're missing, so that they, that's why our perceptions are different. So, yeah. It can, it can often be a learning opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the junior person thinks you're making the wrong prioritization decision, it could be because you are making the wrong prioritization decision, or mm -hmm. it could be they aren't in the full, full, full holding of all the main facts that, you're, that are challenging mm -hmm. you. And so therefore, often you, what you have to do is go back and explain and understand, okay, yes, I understand where you're coming from. Mm. And hopefully, if you're doing a job properly, you should be aware of that problem that they're, they're telling you. Um, and then you can then play back some of the other reasons that you have for the prioritization decision. And if they still feel uncomfortable, you just have to keep talking until everyone in the room is comfortable because you should never leave it where one mm. person thinks one and one thing, person thinks the other because you just haven't got to the right answer yet then. Yeah, I think there's a difference between understanding and disagreement. You know, I've found that 90% yeah. of the time you just misunderstand or you're missing some context. It's I agree. It's only the 10% of the times everybody knows everything and you just fundamentally disagree. And then it comes down to a decision, which as a leader, you should make because you're accountable and responsible for it. Definitely. You, you, you have to make the decision on the best information available. You can also de-risk it. You can pilot it. You can do lots of things to sort of, you know, to, to sort of lessen the impact of making that decision incorrectly, but ultimately it's your decision. I think that's, I think that's a really important point, actually. The thing you said there about um, it's, it's kind of like understanding and disagreement. I think there's a, as well, when you're going through prioritization, which is kind of what we're talking about today, there should be an understanding that there's a difference between disappointment and disagreement as well. Mm -hmm. So you will have to prioritize stuff that you're going to let someone's pet project or the thing that most affects their team and you're going to say we're not going to build this today or potentially not for nine months or a year which is you know often what the decision is um and they're going to be disappointed because they can feel the pain that they're going to have to go through mm. but if you do your job properly they still leave thinking that you've made the right decision and that's that's the important thing is everybody everybody involved and that's the important part of prioritization is to it's not just the decision that you made, but it's the way you communicate that. And it's the way you bring everybody along for that journey. Because if you don't, you may well make the right decisions and find somebody in some other team um, who will then find their way around decisions. Because there's always a way around. There's always a developer that they can go and visit. There's always some other person they can go and ask the question to. So you've got to, you've got to kind of go, well, look, you're going to leave disappointed. But I hope that by the end of this, we can continue talking so that we can come to a point where we agree that it's the right decision. You're just not very happy about it. Yeah, because in, in product, especially especially in digital products where, where your whole yeah. company is offering you know, an experience of something digital, in product, everybody wants you to do something, either risk, yep. compliance, the CEO, you know, all your stakeholders want you to do something. They want you to do their thing. And, and, and yesterday. And yesterday and, and their thing above everybody else's. And yeah, and, and obviously... A lots of people don't have a technological understanding to understand why something could take six months. And you know, and what, yeah, what I've definitely found is is by by getting to the why, why are you trying to do this? 
help me understand why fitting that into the thing that you said the objectives having those having that alignment yeah. around objectives is so powerful because you can then go okay yeah we've got five things you know, which of these five things best fits the best fits the objectives but also can we do now because obviously it's depend always dependencies um and that allows you to sort of really explore that and one of the most powerful things is instead of saying no it's not now you know we can't do that now because because we've got these yeah. other things this is why it's important i know why you want this but this is what this is why we're doing what we're doing not now but that doesn't mean never that means you know as you yeah. said night which which you know, which in startup terms is an eternity away can be yeah, yeah. um and i I, th I think that's actually a really good thing you said about the they're not necessarily no but not now um there is a there's a time and a place for no right when mm. the the idea you've you've analyzed it and you've gone this is going to deliver the goal that we want and then you need to give that message of this is a this is a no and these are the reasons why and i want to take you and hopefully if you if you've been really clever you've got that person involved into the analysis so that they've actually realized it's a bad idea through the process if that's not possible you need to take them through that analysis and explain to them why mm -hmm. but most of the time it's not a competing competition between a good idea and a bad idea it's a competition between mm -hmm. 15 really good ideas which can all bring a huge amount of value to you and often the decisions actually can come down to various people's opinions because there's mm. I, with all the will in the world you can put all your structures you can use cd3 you can use roi you can use whatever formula you want you can create your own special formula at least 60 percent of the numbers that you put in there have some element of mm. that in it right yeah. so in the end it still comes down to a personal opinion and a belief and a belief system but you just need to bring people along so that they understand how you're making those decisions and what beliefs they're based on and you know, potentially crowdsourcing those beliefs so that you know it's not just your your word saying oh this idea will never work for this random arbitrary reason that you've decided that you allow everyone to have their say as well i feel like i'm rambling a bit at the moment no no i think i think that's really and we had this discussion quickly before coming on air which was which is how do you balance top down this is the strategic direction of the company. This is what we need to do to achieve that direction versus bottom up emergent strategy, which is I found something people really love and we should do more of. How do you, in, 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 you know, from what I hear, especially in your environment, it's you know, people can take ideas up, but ultimately the leadership team or the CEO makes the decisions. But how do you, how do you provide that context for sort of, for, for emergent strategy as well as sort of top down strategy? So, I mean, I'll be really honest to say, I'm not sure we've, we've completely cracked it yet. Um, I don't think anybody has. I don't think anybody has. <laughs> um, we haven't either. No. Um, so I think when it comes to, to emerging strategy ideas, I think it's trying to get as much information as you can and also trying to get the real voice of real users um, because there is nothing, nothing else that you can do than, than that. Um, but also trying to find what's the lowest cost way that you can try out the idea. Um, so it really comes back to like, you know, all those books, Lean Startup, MVPs, all those things that you're used to doing. But it's really valuable because if you can say to to the leadership team, look, I'm not asking you to fund whatever it is, half a million quid to build this massive new product. I'm asking you for 15 grand so that we can test out if this idea is viable or not. Um, and then we can come back to you with this set of data, which will you know, will still require interpretation. It will still require the next level bet for you to do, but it give them a series of small bets where you can then bring information to them all the way along. Um, because you're right, the, the problem is, is that people in leadership are decisive and they want to be decisive. So if they're given a, a big choice, they will make it. So they will say, yeah, we're going to throw everything on black because that's the choice that's been given to them. Whereas if you can find a way to, you know, use all of the product knowledge that we have you know we're product managers we're, we're very much clear on these are all the cool things we do this is the way we can test ideas quickly but give them give people the option of choosing that as the option because nine times out of ten if someone is given the choice of you can either spend a million quid or whatever said it's half a million quid on this crazy idea or you can spend 15 grand to see if that idea is actually feasible or not the 15 grand decision is easy the half a million decision is really hard and potentially drives your company off the edge of a cliff. So I, I think that's that's really what you do. And also in reverse, if there is a top-down decision, because all companies have top-down decisions that come down to you, then not saying that's wrong because you disagree with it, but saying, okay, cool, 
what's the quickest way that we can contest this idea and we can get it into a way that that makes sense because again you're not saying i don't agree with that idea you're not saying anything you're just saying cool mm. well i agree i think that's an amazing idea actually i think we should test it out with the smallest number of users in the quickest possible way and it's really hard for people to object to that because you're mm. saying i want to be conservative with your money that mm. that's a really if people then turn around and say no to that then you know that they really believe this thing is a big deal and should probably kind of shut up and figure out a way to get yourself happy with the the concept mm. But mm. normally there is always a way for you to test out the idea and to give them more data as to whether it's going to work or not. That's interesting. I think there's an issue about delivery and discovery there, which is, you know, yeah. we, we have things we're contractually obliged to do and we know we have to do. Yeah. It's sort of, you know, we, nobody has to write a prioritization document. Nobody has to write no. a business case because it's in a contract. That's just exactly. wasted work. If you're contractually obliged to deliver X by, you know, date Y, why write a massive business case? Just get on and do it. When there's the other stuff, which is more about discovery, which is what stuff we're exploring. What we've had to be careful of is, or what we've tried to do is separate strategic decisions from tactical decisions. So yeah. strategic decisions meet one or more criteria. Either you can't test them, they're highly ambiguous, uh, it will take more a team more than two months to execute. If you get it wrong, you could sink the company. If it meets one or more of those criteria, the CEO should make the decision, informed by yeah. lots of people, but ultimately the CEO. If, if, if it doesn't meet those criteria, the team should just make that decision. So if it's an experiment about buttons or shapes or length, yes. this, this, just, or you know, which order to do stuff in, or anything that makes sense, takes less than two months then the team could just go away go for it you've you know, it, you know the product the best you know the customer the best. you know the code the best you, you know we've tried to help you get that alignment through OKRs which we use as well through this vision of where we want to be you make those decisions and that helps me focus you know, the CEO and the leadership tip on small big bets but then it frees up the 90% of the time for teams to exercise their ownership to just go, oh, okay, I just want to run two experiments this sprint. You know, okay. minimal cost. I'm just going to go away and do it. Definitely. I mean, uh, I'll be, I'll be say, say that right now we're in a bit of a weird situation as a business because we're doing, a, as most startups will go through this phase at some point, we're doing a fairly large rewrite of our underlying platform because <laughs> platform version 1.0 was done in you know, as the quickest way humanly possible. And we're now going from, you know, big monolith, hard to maintain into microservice, properly maintainable yeah. software. So then the prioritization decisions definitely become more painful because you're now mm. prioritizing uh, a technical thing against a business outcome. Mm. And the technical thing, it, you can try as hard as you like, but it's really hard to assign any kind of real yeah. business value to that technical work. But you know that it's important. Yeah. Um, I, I wish someone would give me a magic wand that tells me <laughs> so, how so, to do that. So the one thing was the super, and we exactly the same problem. And then your product, both in the, at the product level, but also across products, is is how do you balance the different time horizons, which is you know big stuff that could happen now to move numbers versus you know building for the future. So, so what we've tried to do, well, the way we tried to have this argument is in the next three months, do you want this one big thing to happen and guarantee it? And, and we can guarantee it will happen and it will work, it'll be big. Or do you want us to deliver these three things? Yeah. Three big things. We can deliver these three big things, but it means the first one is going to take, you know, two and a half, two and a half months to sort of build because we're prepping everything. But that makes every subsequent release m much faster. So this will save us, you know, in three or four months, this will save us a, a, a week, a month, or, you know, over this period of time. Yeah, we use we for example we use currencies so we add we're adding currencies now in the past we just okay we've got some spare capacity build another currency and it takes two to four weeks whereas if we said to the team right you've got you've got three months to add as many currencies as possible you take a completely different approach you build it for scale you build it and you could probably add 20 currencies but you'd, you'd have to have that sort of three month gap to be able to make it worthwhile to yeah. build in that scaling from the start so and so I think that, I think that, I think that's really good, which is like you're kind of separating out the the a lot of the small decisions and then allowing people to have a bigger goal, which mm -hmm. which they can aim at, which which does make a lot of choice. I think the the other thing that that we have done, we're not really doing it right now because of the weird team structure. But one of the things we we have done over the the past few months is you you can assign groups of people to 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 work on certain things. So particularly if it comes to tech debt and things like that, you can say right, mm. this team is going to be focused on 
how do we improve the, their background? So it's not all DevOps people, it's going to be developers, it's going to be a range of people. And you can flex people in and out of that team so that you don't have this beautiful tech team that every actually everyone, every one of the developers always wants to work on really crazy technical mm -hmm. stuff. So you can you can rotate people in and out of that team. But then what you have is you have a decision on how much resource do we want to spend on these kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have to get into the trade-off game between do you want this this technical thing, which is really hard to explain, and actually it's got a 20% chance of working and an 80% chance of falling on its face, which mm. is always the case. Maybe it's not quite that high, but there's always a high probability of failure in any one of those technical tasks. Um, but you basically say, well, look, we're willing to spend this much time and money and energy on an ongoing basis on that sort of stuff, and then allow the developers to figure out what that is with some with some oversight, obviously. Um, and then you can then say, right, the rest of you, then your, your focus becomes this. Now, it's not a perfect model um, because there will be stuff that falls that falls outside of that. Mm. No model is perfect. Yeah. But that is one way that I've used in the past, essentially, it's it's a kind of reduce the number of decisions that you mm. have to make because you don't, you don't have to compare six or seven things which are all inherently different. Mm. You can then, you can silo some of the decisions so that you start to choose between things that are, that are similar and then at a higher level you choose between where do we want to invest our money on a more general basis because then you're saying well actually we want to spend 50 percent on maintaining existing products 25 percent on tech and 25 percent on mm. new product that's not what, that's not a decision mm. that we're making but that could be the theoretical decision and then within each area you have much simpler and easier to manage prioritization mm. decisions that's that's one way that i've used it in the past i've used it here i've used it in other places and it does help to just mean you have fewer conversations about mm. should we build this this random thing or this thing which is completely opposite and how do you compare those two things it's it's really hard. No, i think i think that's i think it's quite insightful like you know if you if everything's compared to everything else your technical debt all the all the 10x stuff will always lose out because well, you know, yeah. when you're compared to this month's or this quarter's or this week's okr it's not going to move the needle and it always so you know we've used you know, the one thing we don't do is you know, we see tech debt belonging to the team. You know, we, we, yeah. we don't sort of separate it out, um, which, I, which I think is just a nuance. But, but if yeah. there's a team that is working on something super different that, that would by its nature, if you put in with everything else, get deprioritized because it's more ambiguous or more different, you know, we, we have carved, dedicated carved it out and said, like, you're different. You're doing something differently. You're going to be measured against something different. Um, obviously, you have... You, you have risks, you know, why is that team different? Why are they the cool team that don't have the same OKRs as us? So you always, you always have these trade-offs. Yeah, no, there's, there's, there's no perfect model. No, there isn't. It's all about trade-offs. Yeah, it's all about what, you, what you're willing to trade-off. So this is fantastic. I think we're sort of running out of time. I just want to thank you, Sebastian, for, you know, incredibly insightful, you know, discussion about prioritization, about leadership, about, you know, how to manage up as well as manage down, which I think came up, yeah. came across quite strongly there. You know, some super interesting things for me to go away and reflect on. Um, anyway, thank you so much for your time. I'll just hand over to Ryan now. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I'd give it a two thumbs up as well. So this is how the mind map ended up being. There's a lot of cool nuggets that are in there. And then if I were to say, you know, the, the larger text kind of pops out to me. And one is that this whole process is, is a learning journey or a learner's journey. And I think that's something that we forget to talk about when we talk about prioritization. It seems to be more about matter of fact, when if we really look at it with the lens of learning, a learning lens, um, I think that's the way you bring people along with you. Um, also, context is everything. You talk about this contextual gap. I think it's so important to stop and kind of recalibrate who's speaking, what the context is, and figure out what that gap is. Because again, if we're just looking at the actual items, we're missing in between those gaps, you're missing a lot. And the other talk about this lean concept to where, you know, if you're going to prioritize, you have this huge behemoth, how can we take a little sliver of that and test it? It's just really optimizing your prioritization. So this has been great. We went from leadership philosophy to culture to speaking up first and second. And it really just shows how um, not only is prioritization, prioritization, just a lot of syllables, 
that there's a lot to <laughs> unpack. <laughs> so thanks for your insight. It's great to see how this plays out in the real world. Uh, Max, great discussion for everybody out there. If you enjoy these types of really like fireside chats, then you can find more at Scale Up Valley. Make sure to subscribe where you subscribe, share, like, and reach out to these people because this can be the first dot in a longer conversation. And it takes two dots to make a line. So be brave, be bold, connect with these guys and with myself on LinkedIn or whoever and keep the conversation going. Make it a priority. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody, Max and Sebastian. Great cool. time. We'll see you thanks, online. Thanks, guys. Adios. Thanks very much.